Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, guest hosting for Walt tonight, who's asked me to come and do a series of discussions about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. The New World Order is nothing new at all. It's simply the restoration of the Old World Order on a global scale. The Old World Order was ruled over by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who sits in the temple of God saying that he is God, the Pope of Rome. The Jesuits were created to destroy the Protestant Reformation, the only power on earth that ever put Antichrist back on his heels. The Jesuits were created for one purpose, and that is to destroy the Protestant Reformation and then to elevate the papacy to global supremacy, a global monarch, a king of kings and a lord of lords, in counterfeit of Christ, Jesus Christ, Messiah. Now, we've, just, we've read the Jesuit oath, and I began last Wednesday, uh, line by line, explaining the Jesuit oath to those who've never heard it before or have ever heard it discussed. We were talking about keys. Let me just read the portion that we covered last, last Wednesday. I, and then the postulant states his name, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, St. Peter and Paul, and all the saints, sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly Father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontification of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness, the Pope, is Christ's vice-regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal Church throughout the earth, and that by the virtue of the keys of binding and loosing given to His Holiness by my Savior, Jesus Christ, he hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, and they may be safely destroyed. This first portion of the oath describes the Pope's spiritual and temporal power, and that the Pope, as the replacement of Jesus Christ on earth, has the power, the sole power on earth, to seat and to unseat kings to do likewise to princes or governors, and also to destroy states and commonwealths and governments who do not submit to the papacy's will. This is the definition of Antichrist. King of kings and lord of lords, the, pap the papacy claims to have two keys, as we talked about last time, one representing his spiritual power as as, as great high priest, and then the other representing his temporal sword, that is, his king of kings status. And this represents a union of church and state. For all, the Vatican is a church, and the Vatican is a state. And the Pope is the king of that state, and the lord of that church. And it claims, the Roman Catholic Church claims, and the papacy claims, that the Roman Catholic Church is the only church of Jesus Christ on the earth. It is the only true church of Jesus Christ on the earth, and that everyone else is heretical, heretics. And according to the Council of Constance, and according to Pope Innocent III, heretics are to be destroyed. Now, this is the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church through the Jesuit order. It says in the oath of the Jesuit, when he rises to a rank of superior among the Jesuits, he is one who may extirpate and annihilate kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, 
and that they may be safely destroyed. In other words, it is no sin for them to do this if they do it in the name of the Pope. Now, therefore, the postulant continues, therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine and his holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and now pretended authority of the churches of England and Scotland, Scotland, and the branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they may be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. So you can see from this portion of the oath that this Jesuit has sworn to destroy Protestantism wherever it exists, and also to destroy whatever government, whatever form of government that rose out of the Protestant Reformation. Now, this takes a little bit more of explaining before I continue. During the Old World Order, when the Pope ruled supreme over the kings of the earth, there was the people had no say in government. The Pope dictated to the kings of the earth how they should govern the people. Then, at the time of the Protestant Reformation and the, and the availability of the printing press and the increased number of Bibles written in the language of the people, People began to read the Scripture for the first time in their lives in their own language. They began to read the Scripture for themselves. And that was when they discovered that Christ was the King of kings and Lord of lords, not the Pope. And that the Pope was a usurper of Christ's rightful throne. And they universally recognized that he was Antichrist, the Antichrist of the Bible the counterfeit Christ. And so, understanding this, they left the Roman Catholic Church. Millions upon millions of Roman Catholics left the, the Catholic Church and joined the Protestant Reformation. And when they realized that Christ was their king and Christ was their great high priest and not the Pope, well, they no longer needed the Pope to rule over them. They had Christ and they, they had a new king and a new priest. And they also learned from the Scripture that they now, not the Pope, but they themselves, having accepted Christ as their Savior and their King and their Lord, they realized that they were endowed with the Holy Spirit and the ability to read and understand the Scriptures for themselves and that through the Scriptures, God had written his law upon their hearts. They realized that they didn't need a pope to govern them, that they had a government within. And so they sought to overthrow the monarchs who were subservient to the papacy and ruled the people with a rod of iron and kept the people poor and, keep, and kept the people disadvantaged and slaves to the state. Now, they overthrew their governments and elected their own representatives and formed their own constitutions. Some formed republics, others formed uh, monarchical constitution, constitutional monarchies, but they all rejected the papacy as Antichrist. The idea that the Pope was the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist was the very fuel that maintained the Protestant Reformation. It gave birth to the Protestant Reformation, and it maintained it. Now, you might understand that as this began to catch on, and more and more Roman Catholics became aware that Christ was, this, was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the Pope was a, a cheap counterfeit, it, de it looked as though the Roman Catholic Church was destined to destruction for just simple lack of a lack of uh, uh, respect by the people. So it became an imperative. It became a necessary uh, attempt to save 
the Roman Catholic Church from utter destruction that the Jesuit order was created. And its purpose, number one, is to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And most particularly, in order to destroy the Protestant Reformation, it must destroy all understanding that the Pope is the Antichrist. No matter what happens, the only way to truly destroy the Protestant Reformation is to destroy that belief that the Pope is the Antichrist. And we're going, to so, we're going to show you, after we continue with it, after we finish describing this oath and explaining it, we're going to show you precisely how the Jesuits have destroyed the Protestant Reformation by destroying any knowledge that the Pope is the Antichrist. Now, the postulate continues. He says, I do now denounce and disown any allegiances as due to any heretical king, prince, or state, that is, a Protestant king, prince, or state, named Protestant or liberal, or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name Protestant or Masons, to be damned, to be damnable, and they themselves to be damned, who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Ireland, or America, or in any kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant and Masonic doctrines and to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise. Now, this is a very serious oath that they're taking. Every Jesuit of the higher rank swears this oath. And you can see from this oath that it is their, their bounden duty to destroy Protestants wherever they are in the world. And when they cease to, be, to do this, they cease to be Jesuits. They violate their oath. Uh, and it is a bloody oath that if they ever fail to, compl to fulfill their oath, that they are to be tortured and killed by their own Jesuits. Now he says, I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding, I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother Church's interests. In other words, he can assume the religion of Protestantism for the benefit of the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, a spy to infiltrate Protestant churches. He continues, he says, to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time as they entrust me and not to divulge directly or indirectly by word, writing, or circumstances, whatever, but to execute all that should be proposed, given in charge, or discovered to me by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred order. So they are to maintain this secrecy and then to do whatever the Pope or the Jesuit general tell them to do, all for the benefit of the Roman Catholic Church. So if the Jesuits are true to their order, true to their oath, and true to their order, and true to their Jesuit general, and true to the Pope, they're going to do whatever they can do to infiltrate the Protestant churches, to even seek to preach from their pulpits, to teach them false doctrines and false beliefs in order to destroy the Protestant Reformation, and failing that, to destroy every Protestant on the earth. That is their oath. He says, I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or a cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. 
See, they regard the Jesuit order as a militia for the Pope, a military. It's not an order of priests. It is a militia under the disguise of priests. Now, he continues, he says, that I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions of the north, the jungles of India, to the centers of civilization in Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever is communicated to me. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly and openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do, to extirpate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, nor condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, slay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs of the wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly... I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority, persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do by, my, by any agents of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Father of the Society of Jesus." in confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, soul, and all corporal powers, and with the dagger which I now receive, I will describe my name written in my own blood in testimony thereof. And should I prove or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly be opened and sulfur burned therein with all the punishment that can be afflicted upon me on earth, and my soul shall be tormented by demons in eternal hell forever. That I will, in voting, always vote for a Knight of Columbus in preference to a Protestant, especially a Freemason, and that I will leave my party so to do, that if two Catholics are on the ticket, I will satisfy myself which is the better supporter of the Mother Church and vote accordingly, that I will place Catholic girls in Protestant families, that a weekly report may be made of the inner movements of the heretics, that I will provide myself with arms and ammunition, that I may be ready in readiness when the word is passed, or I am commanded to defend the Roman Catholic Church either as an individual or with the militia of the Pope, all of which I, and again he states his name, do swear by the blessed Trinity, the blessed sacrament, which I am now to receive, to perform, uh, and on part to keep, my, to keep this my oath. In testimony hereof, I take this most holy, blessed sacrament, excuse me, and the Eucharist, and witness the same further with my name written with the point of the dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy sacrament. And at this point, the oath is taken, and it is finished when he signs his name with his own blood and then consecrates that oath by taking the sacrament of the Eucharist, the Mass, as it is called in the Roman Catholic Church, where it is celebrated, where they celebrate a renewal of the of the crucifixion of Christ, where the mat, where the wafer is transformed into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ to be crucified once again on the altar and eaten. That's what the mass really is, and that's how every Jesuit sanctifies himself and swears to this oath. And then he is elevated to a rank of commander in the militia of the Pope. Their, their determination is to restore 
what was lost by the papacy because of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was a return to the true faith of Jesus Christ. It was Roman Catholics in the old world order who, having read the Bible for the first time in their own language, understood then, for the first time in their lives, who Jesus Christ really was and who his counterfeit was on the earth. The papacy fulfills every prophecy in the Bible regarding Antichrist. There's no other candidate on earth for that title. Now, I know that's not what you've been taught in your Protestant churches, but I suggest that everyone listening to the sound of my voice don't take my word for it. Simply read the writings of all the Protestant reformers, every one, every single one, to the last man, every single one of the Protestant reformers declared the papacy to be Antichrist. And it is due to the Jesuits having fulfilled this oath, infiltrating Protestant churches, teaching lies, all for the benefit of the Roman Catholic Church, that we in our generation are ignorant as to who Antichrist really is. And we wait for a future Antichrist, supposedly one that comes within the last seven years before Christ returns. Someone who is supposedly to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews in a brand new nation-state of Israel. <clears throat> That's what I was taught for over 50 years in the Protestant churches. But they can hardly call themselves Protestant churches. Because to be truly Protestant, you have to protest Antichrist. And it's a little difficult to protest an Antichrist that hasn't even come yet. You see, even the name Protestant is testimony to the fact, the historical historical fact that Protestantism is built upon a foundation not only of Christ, but of rejecting and protesting Antichrist. Literally, it has only been the last two and a half to three generations of Protestants who were not aware of who Antichrist is. Only three generations Prior to our generation, prior to the deception put forward by the Jesuits, all Protestants knew who the Antichrist was. There was no question in their mind. They realized that God didn't play games with his people. As much trouble as Christ went to to make sure that all of his people knew that he was the Christ, and that we should receive and obey him to the exclusion of all others. He also wanted us to know, just equally as assuredly as Jesus is the Christ, that the Pope is the Antichrist. And when you see the information that we're going to present now, you'll know for a certainty who the Antichrist is. Now, for the, 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 the real gem, the greatest deception, I call this the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, was perpetrated by the Jesuits and taught in the Protestant churches for the very purpose of getting them to forget what all Protestants believed and taught, that the Pope was Antichrist, and they used the Bible to do it. If you want to see this for yourself, turn with me now to Daniel chapter 9, and we'll begin at the beginning of the chapter, and then we'll focus on the prophecy beginning in verse 24 through the end of the chapter, verse 27, that foretells the coming of Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, and continuing, reads... 
In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spoke in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of Israel. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, to all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake unto us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done, as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hast gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. I'm about to run out of time. I had hoped to have gotten all this in before the end of the program, but Daniel is on his face repenting. For having forgotten God's law, he's, for, he's confessed his own sins and the sins of Israel. And God has heard his prayer even before he prayed it. And he has sent an angel to give him a prophecy of the coming of Messiah. And that will be the discussion of our program next Wednesday <laughs> on Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My Tom, name is Tom, Tom Press. You, you, you got 15 more minutes, Tom. Oh, I have 15 more minutes. Praise the Lord. Okay, I'll continue. <clears throat> now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary, 
that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. The beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Here is the prophecy of the coming of Messiah. And because Israel did not understand the true meaning of this prophecy, they did not know the time of their visitation. And I'm here to tell my listeners tonight, that it is this same prophecy given by, by Gabriel the archangel to Daniel that was misunderstood by Israel, for they knew not the time of their visitation. This is the same prophecy that the Jesuits have twisted and taught us erroneously about, and that we will not that we will be just as deceived as were the Jews at the time of Jesus' advent in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. History is about to repeat itself. The Gentiles are going to make a grievous error about the time of their visitation. Because the Jews did not understand this prophecy they knew not the time of their visitation. They did not recognize Jesus as the Christ. But because of our misunderstanding of this prophecy, we will believe in a false Christ, the Antichrist. Now, before I even begin at verse 24, the beginning of this prophecy, I want you to get a piece of paper and pencil. We're going to do a little math, real easy stuff, Okay. First of all, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and, and let me say this before we even start. This prophecy is about the first coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It's all about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and his coming, and Jerusalem, and the Jews. No mention is made anywhere in this prophecy about Antichrist. Not one word. Now, I know that's not what you've been taught in your churches, but just be patient and follow with me prayerfully, and I'm sure God will reveal to you the truth. Now, if you have your piece of paper and pencil and you're ready to copy, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 says... Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, that is the Jews, Daniel's people, no one else, just Daniel's people, and upon thy holy city, we all know that to be Jerusalem, that's, I mean, this is what Daniel was praying about, the Jews, and about Jerusalem, he says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression 
and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So we're going to have 70 weeks of time for all of this stuff to be fulfilled. Every single item listed here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Now, for those who've never heard this before, 70 weeks represents 70 periods of seven years. That's 490 years. Exactly 490 years. Not one year less, not one year longer. 490 years. It's all going to take place within 490 years. And then we're going to get even more specific as this prophecy continues. Remember, 490 years are determined upon, that is, Daniel's people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy. In other words, it's all going to be fulfilled by the end of the 490th year. It's going to all be sealed up. Everything about this vision is going to be sealed up. Everything about this prophecy is going to be sealed up and finished and fulfilled completely and perfectly by the end of this 490th year. And he ends, and to anoint the most holy. Anybody guess who the most holy is? That's Jesus Christ. He's got to be anointed. Scripture reveals that that was fulfilled perfectly and completely, just as it's written here in Daniel. But we're going to continue. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, not Antichrist, Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks, that is, seven periods of seven years, or 49 years, so you can write that down. First of all, write down 70 weeks equals 490 years. Now, that 490-year period is broken up into three parts. We're talking about the first part of that 490 years, the first part of that 70 weeks. He says, Now therefore, and know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, that's 49 years, seven times 70 is, or excuse me, <clears throat> seven times seven is 49, and three score and two weeks, that is 62 weeks, that the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, we're going to do a little math. We've got the whole, the whole prophecy is going to take place in 70 weeks, 490 years. The first part of that 490 years is broken off, and it's called seven weeks, or 49 years. Seven times seven is 49. And then another portion is separated <clears throat> and it's defined as three score and two weeks. Now, a score, you know, we're leave it living in a generation that no longer re 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 regards a, a, a score, but a score used to be 20. So if you have three score, you have 60, right, plus two weeks. In other words, 62 weeks. That's 483 years. Now, if you add these 62 weeks... And the seven weeks that came previous or will come previous to the 62 weeks, what do you have? 62 plus 7 is what? 69. 
69 weeks, 483 years. Now, the prophecy is for 490 years. So there's one week remaining, one seven-year period of time left to the complete fulfillment of this prophecy. And we're going to talk about that final seven-year period of time, that 70th week of Daniel. Now he says, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now let me stop right there. Remember, the first division of that 490 years, the first division of the 70 weeks was seven weeks. The second segment, or the second division of those 70 weeks, is 62 weeks, altogether making 69 weeks. So it is legitimate to say that what this verse is talking about, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 is talking about, is after the 69th week shall Messiah be cut off. Because the seven-week period of time preceded the, the three-score and two-week period, altogether making 69. So it's just as legitimate to say it's just as legitimate to say in verse 26, quote, 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Does everybody agree with that? This is not confusing. The angel Gabriel broke the, 79, the, six, the, the 70 weeks into three periods. The first period of seven weeks, the second period of 62 weeks, and then simple deduction, we have to conclude that there must be one more week to finish up the 70 weeks. 7 plus 62 equals 69. And here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it says, and after three score and two weeks, in other words, after the second period, which literally means after both the first and the second period, or altogether, 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off for himself. It says, after the 69th week shall Messiah be cut off. Now, if it's after the 69th week, it must certainly be during the 70th week that Messiah was cut off. I see I'm out running out of time. But I've given you something to think about, something very, very important to think about before we meet again next Wednesday. And I want to thank my friend Walt Stickle for inviting me to come and give this correct interpretation of Daniel's 70 weeks. The 70th week of Daniel is over, my friends. There's no future 70th week of Daniel. Jesus was cut off in the midst of the 70th week of Daniel. If that is true, then why are they teaching in the churches a future 70th week? Unless, of course, somebody wants to redo the 70th week for a very diabolical purpose. Remember, it was because the Jews did not understand the 70 weeks of Daniel, the prophecy given to Daniel by the, the archangel Gabriel, that they knew not the time of their visitation. Misunderstanding Daniel's prophet, prophecy is going to have equally grave consequences for God's people in our generation. We know who the Christ is, but we are woefully confused in our generation about who the Antichrist is. And that is going to make all the difference. Remember, 